Thank you for joining me for another Quick Hits Conversation. I'm Dr. Robin. I'm a concierge high-performance psychologist providing luxury-level support to executives, entrepreneurs, celebrities, dignitaries, and athletes. With me today, I have Gladie Baradarin. She has 15 years of HR experience and a love for organizational development. I have Lisa McDonald. She is the founder of Career Polish, where she is an executive career coach, master mindset coach, and helps people get career happy and life healthy. I have Diane Helbig. She is the founder of Helbig Enterprises, where they serve business owners and professionals who want to realize better outcomes and greater happiness. She is an author and the host of the podcast, Accelerate Your Business Growth. The question I have today, what do you do when you feel intimidated? I, I thought about it and look at it in two ways. One of them is like when I'm in a situation and I feel intimidated and this is a time that somebody's in front of me and is so smart and they know everything and they're just like, well, I feel like in love with them. And, and at that point, I feel intimidated and I feel like there's butterflies and I want to learn, but I'm shy. I, th I feel like a positive, good thing. Mm. The second one is when somebody makes me feel intimidated. So it comes from outside. Mm. So I'm in a situation and somebody talks down or acts up or they're not compassionate. Then my first reaction is literally is crying. Like my oh, tears yeah. comes out, the emotion comes out. Inside I feel upset, anger, but fears and, and all these emotions coming together. So mm. for me, I look at it in these two different ways. I like one, the other one I really don't like. So I read this question and my first thought was, I don't feel intimidated. And then I thought, oh, of course I do. There are definitely times when I feel intimidated and I realized that I get very quiet, mm -hmm. which is not my norm uh, <laughs> because I, I just, I really don't want to say anything because I'm pretty sure that the response that I'm going to get is going to make me feel even worse. Maybe it's going to be validated or that I know the person's going to um, respond in a way that isn't going to be positive, nurturing, anything like that. So I'd rather just be quiet. I am more in lines kind of with what Gladys said is that I immediately took it in two different ways. One was, is somebody trying to intimidate you? And I think this is from being a, um, a survivor from somebody physically or verbally trying to be intimidating. So my instincts from my past experience is kind of like my first instinct is, or, you know, it's like, all right, let's go. So I have to kind of check myself and say, okay, where is this coming from? Are they true in doing this? Or is this a trigger from you? So that's, that's one intimidation. The other intimidation was, am I intimidated when I try something new? Mm -hmm. So for example, launching a, a new program and I'm putting one together and that's exactly where I am right now. I think intimidation is a great word to put it all together. The fear, the anticipation and the excitement, the, the self-doubt, all those things. I think intimidation kind of brings that together. So from that perspective, that's when I kind of have to take another step back and say, okay, if not you, who, if not now and so what's your main force to do it? I didn't think about the two sides, but now that you've mentioned it, yes, exactly. So I have kind of two stories. One, when I met Joe Montana, I was so like fangirl. I couldn't even like <laughs> talk to him. I was just like, oh, hi, you know, so <laughs> intimidated and weirded out. Another time where I was talking to the head of a chamber of commerce and telling him who I was and what I did. And he looked over my head and was obviously not listening to me, was looking for other people to talk to. And in that moment, I felt intimidated and I felt stupid and I felt small. Yeah. And it's so interesting how I still remember that, oh, I don't matter feeling. There was no way for me to recover from that in that moment talking to him. I just basically let him walk away from me mid-sentence. But then what? What do I do with that feeling then? It depends though, because when I look at the situations in my head, the old me that many years ago that didn't have much experience, it would have really crumbled down and affected me for a long time mm -hmm. and in all my other actions or interactions. The new me, which I'm trying to build, is not perfect, but I'm all like, all right, let's shrug it. It hurts me. I recognize it. I let it go through me. And, and I'm like, okay, it's uncomfortable. Let's let it go. 
it's not as easy that I'm saying, but mm. it's a practice that works and you just move on and you don't go back on it to nag because more you go back on it, more you get uncomfortable. You're like, it, it, it belongs to him. It didn't work out. Let's move on. Or you try to learn something from it. But again, emotionally, it's not easy. Mm-hmm. I think that was a great thing that you just said is it belongs to him. Mm-hmm. And that that's a key is to... And I think we have a natural instinct to take ownership of it. What did I do? Why is he not interested in what I'm saying? Those type of, why are they looking over my head? I think we kind of internalize that. And and Gladie, I agree, as we grow and evolve, that's something I try to do is look at it and go, thank goodness, but just get that out of my past so I can find people that I really want to connect with. So that saves me by him behaving in that way. And then I take a, a gratitude for it. I'm glad that happened early. So we didn't waste time. One of the things that I do is, it's so funny because when you were talking about the the story about the chamber exec, I was thinking, whenever I encounter people like that, I, I, I immediately, what goes comes into my mind is, wow, do you realize the negative impact you're having on your organization by behaving mm-hmm. that way? So what I do is I use it as fuel for articles, blog posts, wisdom conversations, because I have to get it out of me. Like That's my processing is to just get it out of my system. So writing or speaking it out it, for me is, and then I figure, okay, maybe it can be a lesson for other people that they'll realize this is just not the way to be. Mm-hmm. I definitely use the stories. Obviously I just told it, right? <laughs> but thinking about writing it isn't something that's occurred to me, which I guess I could use it that way. And I have been, and I don't know, writing isn't my first go-to, talking certainly is. Yeah. Going back to the organizational setting, because it's easy when you're in a group and somebody does that, but if it's your boss and boss's boss and you're working on a project and they make you feel intimidated and they constantly put you down and whatever you do, they find the wrong thing in it instead of the right one. Mm. It becomes even harder because uh-huh. you, you're living that. You cannot just walk away from it. Every day is happening. Your project's going to go to the hand of that person and they're going to be attacking it and making you feel intimidated. So yeah. I feel like at cases like that is not good in organizations. You don't want leaders like that. Hopefully we have to train them or move them out. Or as an employee, you really have to try to find something else because that's not the place to stay day after day. We can right. turn it around too, because I've had men say to me, you're so intimidating. Uh-huh. And I'm like, oh, yeah. But am I intimidating or are you intimidated? Is that on you or am I doing something? I think that's such a great point because I would imagine that everybody on this panel has been told that Mm. from a male, you're intimidating. And I've also thought the same thing. And that's where my dad told me, he said, it's not you. If somebody's telling you that you're intimidating, that means they want you to change to make them feel better. You're being selfish because you're not pleasing me. So you need to focus on me more. He said, don't change who you are for anybody else. If they're intimidated, that's on them. 100%. I would say your checkpoint. Am I compassionate? Am I doing the right thing? Mm. Then I'm correct. But if they're saying something to me and I know I've done something wrong, I understand. But often it's because I'm just being a human as I am and they want to diminish who you are. Mm. So that's the power dynamic that happens. Yeah, you know what, Gladdy? I'm so glad that you said that because the first thought I had about being intimidating is, so I, I know I'm intimidating, but I used to be intimidating in a bad way. And it mm. was me. Mm. You evolve. And I, I had to be able to listen to it and consider it and think to myself, okay, is it something I'm doing? for the most part it was. So I had to grow up. I had to adapt. I had to change the way I communicated to some degree. Now, if I'm intimidating, it's, it's totally different. That's on them. It's because I'm confident. I'm sure of myself. My, my presence is just really one of confidence. So that that's a whole, that's someone else's issue. It's so interesting how there's two sides of this coin. Cause we're, we, we have all said we've had people try to intimidate us on purpose. And that's a negative that's on them. We've also had a situation where we have intimidated someone and we have been doing the right thing and that's on them as Uh well. But I think Uh there's a lot of self-awareness that has to come into that about if someone says you're intimidating or you make me feel intimidated, like there's a, there's a big conversation there. So I appreciate you having this short 
interlude into it with me. I hope I didn't intimidate anybody. I look forward <laughs> to speaking to each of you again really soon.